Thank you, Brother Joseph. Thank you. Shall we pray? Our Father, we thank you today for the Lord Jesus, for his grace towards us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died in our stead to justify we ungodly people and bring us back into the fellowship with the Father to the reconciliation by his own blood of Calvary, where he so freely gave it for us all. And today we're enjoying these privileges because he was willing. And now, Father, may we be willing to go and share this great blessing with others. Help us to know thee better by the gathering this afternoon. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Happy to see today is our host pastor, Brother James Jones, from Indianapolis back there. So happy to brother from Spindale also. Brother Winston here from California. I believe just was looking, I've seen Brother Stockman here with Lars from, from up in Canada where we just had the great meeting up there. And many other friends. It certainly is a privilege today to speak to such a host of people who I am expecting to live an eternity with in glory and have the privilege today to be standing to speak to you and fellowship with you around the Word of God. And it certainly is a privilege to do this. Now, last evening we had a great time in the Lord. That's right. The Holy Spirit was really poured out his blessings on us last night in a tremendous way. And tonight we're going to have the old-fashioned prayer line that we used to have years ago because we're going to um, uh, to speak to you a little while this afternoon, fellowship with you with the Word, and then tonight speak again. And sometimes that way the, the anointing of the Holy Spirit for those divine visions doesn't come just as they should if you're kind of upset. And not, I don't mean upset, I mean over-enthused or something. It just doesn't seem to work just right. So, Brother Joseph, I told him I'd like to have one night of that before leaving, and he has been so gracious to give it to us and to have it that way. And now uh, I am expecting God to heal many of the sick and afflicted. I'm going to ask the boys if they will go ahead and give out the prayer cards anyhow, a large number of them tonight, so we can keep order in the prayer lines to have the sick to come to. So if you've got any loved ones that's needy of prayer and you believe that by laying on hands is the God's healing power for the sick today, why you bring them out tonight because we expect to get a great host of them to the line. And now, it's such a short time we have to speak and such a so much to speak about. As long as we're speaking about the Lord Jesus, we got much to speak about. How every word so inspired. And um, I'm going to ask Pastor Joseph if he'll make ready to read a text for me or a scripture reading. Then I have something else come on my mind just now. And uh, I'm just to have the New Testament with me. So I want him to read it for a background from the Old Testament. Second Chronicles 18, 22 to 27. I'm going to ask him to read this for us. And you might read it with him if you wish to as a background for my text this afternoon. Second Chronicles. Uh, 18, 22 to about, about 27. And may the Lord add his blessing now to the reading of his word. While he, you're turning to it, I'm going to ask this brother here from California, uh, have you heard anything about the meeting where we're going, what time we're going to be there in your city in Oakland and be there? Uh, the brother was making it up a few days ago, and I... Well, thank you, brother. Yes. All right. Thank you. I just wanted us to be, I think, we're to go east at uh, Idaho in November and December and come there in January or February. I think it's like the January and the 1st of February or either this other part is to be up here in the east or either go give up to the west coast and then go east. But I hope to see you there, brother. Here's some of that wonderful teaching. <laughs> All right, brother. 20 seconds. Uh, now, therefore, behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of these thy prophets, and the Lord hath spoken evil against thee. 
Then Sedekarab, the son of Shinana, came near and smote Martha upon the cheek and said, Which way went the Spirit of the Lord from me to speak unto thee? And Martha said, Behold, thou shalt see on that day when thou shalt go into an inner chamber to hide thyself. Then uh, the king of Israel said, Take ye Micah and carry him back to Ammon, the governor of the city, and to Joab, the king's son. And say, Thus saith the king, Put this fellow in prison, and feed him with bread of affliction, and with water of affliction, until I return in peace. And Micah said, If thou certainly return in peace, then hath not the Lord spoken by me. And he said, Hearken, all ye people. Now in this, the 17th chapter of St. John, I read for a text. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. And may he add his blessings to his word. Today, thinking to use this for a platform, the reading of the word, that of the Old Testament, for a platform for the text in the New Testament, and praying that God will give us the context as we wait upon him. This time in the Old Testament had been a, a, is a very shaky time. Now, Jehoshaphat was the king of Judah at the time, while Ahab was king of Israel at the time they had been divided. And any time where, when we are divided, we can look for trouble. Right. We must be united there. Right. And then we will stand. And so Jehoshaphat was a, a righteous man, a good man. He had had some good bringing up and a lot of examples as we've had today. He's seen his father Asa, how that when Asa served the Lord, then God was with him. But when Asa failed to serve the Lord and got stubborn, then God departed from him. No matter how well the Lord loves us and how well you love the Lord, when you depart from serving and worshiping the Lord, then just remember you can look for trouble to start in. Because God told David one time, Thou art a man after my own heart. And then when David did wrong, David had to reach for what he sowed. And we never told us that we were after his own heart, so we'll surely have to reach what we sow. But during this time, Asa got a disease in his feet, and he died with it because he did not ask the Lord for divine healing. He just went to the doctors alone. He wouldn't ask the Lord. He's too stubborn. And he just got to a place where he began to listen to some modernistic Jews and didn't believe, maybe, didn't believe the Lord healed, so he didn't consult the Lord, nothing about it. He thought, well, my doctor can help me. There's no need to ask anybody else. So the Bible said he slept. He was taken to the tombs of his father, his fathers, and there he rested. And now Jehoshaphat, his son, raising up to take his place, had a good background to look upon. To see that when a man will walk for God and walk with God, God will walk with the man. But when that same individual turns his back from God, then God just lets him shift for himself. And we find out it's a very bad thing when we have to shift for ourselves. I never tried to trust my own wisdom because I had none. I'm so glad that I do not. If I had some, maybe I would try to trust in it. But the Lord just seems fit that I didn't have any, so I just have to trust in him. And I believe it would be good if we all just tried that a while, don't you think? Just don't take our own ideas about things, but rest solemnly upon just saith the Lord. Don't try to reason, because you can't reason. If you can reason out and see just exactly how it's going to be, it would not be an act of faith anymore. Faith is what you do not see. It's what you believe that you don't, you do not see it, but there's something inside of you sees it. 
And that's God that's inside sees his own word being made manifest. But you couldn't reason it. I just, there's no way of doing it. God never can be reasoned because he's beyond reason. He's God. And we just take what he said about it and call it the truth. Now, in this convention today, and while this is going on and having this great uh, fellowship, I kind of thought maybe that just a few words of how to present to the people, because knowing that most of you here are far ahead of me when it comes to teaching scripture, and I, I know positive there's man sitting here that, my, that I feel little to stand here by. But being that, that we are associated together, I would like to give my view of what it is. And, uh, and my warning to those who refuse to walk in God's path that he's ordained for us to go in. Now, during this time, Ahab was king of Israel, and he was a very indifferent. We have people like that today, what I would call kind of a borderline believer. He just goes anyways. Uh, the wind is blowing. I believe we today call it mission cotton. And just any way the wind blows, they got their sails set to go into it. The Bible don't want us to be that way. He wants us to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding. Have our sails set directly towards Calvary. If the wind's blowing contrary, there's a way of packing that sail or ship. And making that wind go coming right in your face, you can sail right straight into the wind. That's the way you set your sail. That's it. And we get our charter set right towards Calvary, and no matter which way the wind's blowing, we're still looking to Calvary. Whether it's absent or whether whatever it is, we still are set towards Calvary. That's the true believer. And then we're not passed about by every wind of doctrines, and this comes in and that comes in and this takes place. We just got one solid course that's right to Calvary. I think that's what God meant when he spoke to Jude uh, over there and said, a cloud without rain, wandering stars, just wandering around about. That's, that's not right. We shouldn't do that. We should just, when a Christian is first born in the kingdom of God, his affection, his life, his everything is set right on Christ. You're just a little bit smart. You know what? You'll put all of it over on education and go off to real cold, formal, and indifferent and everything, some theology or some great interpretation of Greek words. I met a man here some time ago, and he said, Billy, I just learned a certain Greek word. I've been on it for five years trying to learn the real meaning of this Greek word. So when I found it, is it a blessing? I said, you've been five years learning one Greek word? Yes. Yeah. I said, in that five years, by God's grace, I've won a half million souls to Christ, not knowing any Greek word. So, <laughs> that's, it isn't what you know, it's who you know. To know him is right. And we spend so much time on those things which is foolish. Just, I don't mean foolish, which it doesn't do us any good. When you do know, what good does it do you? None. So you just might as well know him. And then if he becomes this person that's centered on Christ, if he's just a little bit nervous or emotional, if you don't want that individual, he'll drift off to this side into fanaticism. And he'll become a wrecker just every way the wind blows your ego, everywhere the rattle comes or he'll take after it. But you don't want that. One's just as contrary as the other one is. But we want to be centered. Christ, and there alone, look to the Lamb of God. Look and live. Now, and so Jehoshaphat had seen when his father looked at God, that God blessed him. And he had seen that Ahab turned from God because his wife didn't want to go to church on Wednesday night and so forth, you know. So they found out that he had become a lukewarm, wishy-washy. Kicked about. You know, I believe if I did not believe in Christ, I'd be firmly against him. 
And I believe if I would express myself and in my heart I was against him and didn't believe him, if I'd make myself against him, he'd respect me more than he would if I'd be a wishy-washy tossed about. Right. I believe that even in human life, you take a woman, a young lady, now we're just a school of class, a young lady, she might not be pretty, but if she's a real lady, and she holds her place as a lady. You know, she'll be respected more than a pretty woman that doesn't hold her place, you see? That's right. Because if uh, any man that's got an ounce of man about him will respect that true and loyalty. And then if we become a Christian, we must put all the loyalty and respect and honor on the Lord Jesus Christ. And then if we're not, and do not believe it. Don't just wish you wash you about it. Just let the world know where you're standing. That's the best way. And it will be a great day when the church comes to that place. It's members, rather. And whether it will either be for Christ or against Christ. Then the whole world will know how you stand. I don't like anyone to pat me on the shoulder and say, Now, Brother Branham, I really love you. When he knows that I'm no different. Right. See? He knows that I'm no different because his spirit just doesn't even fit right. It just isn't there. And so I, I, then I lose respect for that person. I, I like to see a man if he said, Now look, I, I disagree with you with that. I, well, then he's honest about it. But Ahab wasn't that kind of a person. He was one who wanted to, to serve the Lord one time and his wife wanted to do something else and he would turn that way and have the prophet killed and so forth. One of those wishy washy up and down, in and out. And God can never do nothing with a person like that. Right. He couldn't in that day or any day could he ever use a person like that. So we notice that Jehoshaphat had seen the results from that kind of a life. He'd seen the results from his father when he served the Lord, and then when he didn't serve the Lord. So all of that together and taking it under consideration, Jehoshaphat had purpose in his heart to serve the Lord and to cling to the things that his father David did at the beginning. I like that. At the beginning, the Bible says. In other words, he went back to the old landmark and then they clean out the road. It would be good for Pentecost to go back to the old landmark. It would be good for all of us to go back to the old landmark and clean out the road. What would happen today? In a, I'm talking to, I suppose, mostly Pentecostal people here this afternoon. What would happen if after the church went back to the old landmark? You talk about a cleaning up, there'd really be one around the Pentecostal church. It sure would. Now, how many know that's the truth? Why, well, sure. Yeah. There'd certainly be a, certainly, uh, a reformation going on. <laughs> Oh, how people would be acting different, dressing different, talking different, and it would just be all together a different church if we went back to the old landmark where we started from. Now, so then God bless him. God will bless anyone who will go back to the old landmark of the Bible and start from the Bible, not according to theology, but from, or some man-made theology, but from true Bible theology and start from the old landmark and move up, God will move with you. So God began to bless Jehoshaphat, and the first thing you know, he began to prosper him, and he built up all the garrisons so that the uncircumcised and the could not come in, and that's what the church needs today. It's a garrison of the old-time apostolic teaching, so this lukewarm, formal, in and out, up and down, doesn't get into our church. What did I say? That's right, old. That's right. We have permitted too many things to creep in, brethren. Too many things that we left the old landmark from the beginning to creep in. We never garrisoned the church. And now we've got everything in it. That's right, all isms and isms and, and everything else in the church because we never garrisoned by the word. I was speaking today at lunch with Brother Duplessis and Brother Joseph, and was speaking about foreign missions in a worldwide uh, revival, that uh, worldwide mission journey that I'm fixing to take around the world, in every city, a few nights, every major city of the world. Then, thinking of the power up, 
I said, it's like, they said, if you don't have the follow-up, then you lose what you, you went after. Like I had a, a bullet in my hand. I told you what a famous shell that was. How the velocity of this shell will penetrate at a certain distance, and what a, a, a muzzle velocity it has. It'll travel at the speed of 5,000 feet per second over the old fashioned gun that maybe travel or a thousand foot per second. Now the shell is all right. If I place up the cartridge into your hand, but what can you do with it? You haven't got a gun to use it in. So there you are. We've got to have a follow-up. We've got to have a garrison. We've got to have the church set in order. Marching a great front to go forward. We're just losing time until the church gets in that kind of a condition. We'll see if I'm a few here, that's true. But not like we would if we were all one great undivided group of people. One great big trunk. The enemy in an army, if part of them is the Kentuckians are shooting up the Hoosiers, and the Hoosiers are shooting up the Kentuckians, the Illinois got the Missourians in a war, while the armies are just that off to let them kill themselves. But when they all become united, that's when the enemy sticks his ears up and takes away. And when all the great hosts of God unite themselves together under one banner, the leading of the Holy Spirit and moves on as the great church of the living God, then the enemy will take flight. We've got to do it. And we see in the Bible our example. So if you notice, after God blessing this great man, Jehoshaphat, prospered him and everything began to go fine. One day he thought he'd take a visit down to his neighbor Ahab. And as he went down to visit Ahab, he thought, well, I have some fellowship down there. Now there's where he made a mistake, right there. Called all and water won't mix. That's right. Neither will a believer with unbelief mixed together. There's got to be one side or the other. You've got to make a stand and continue to stand. So as he went down to see Ahab, oh, what a reception he got. Oh, my, he had killed oxen, sheep, and so forth, and lambs, and made a great feast. And now that's just the way the enemy comes in. That's just the way it did to his sisters. When it begins, some woman come in, and the church begin to pat her on the back, and she She's a bobbed-haired woman and wore makeup and things like that. The first thing you'll begin to gradually creep in, and now the whole church is mixed up in it. Amen. Now, you don't let it hurt you, but we need an operation. <laughs> That's right. And when a man got to a place that he wasn't a man, her husband, and let her do that, that showed his weakness. That's right. He's supposed to be the head of the house. So, but today, the whole nation is in that trend, and America is not no more really America. It's not no more a Christian nation. It's a woman's nation. Little old Jesse Bell go down the street all painted up and let her man her fall on her knees to her. That's right. I know that kind of hurts, but that's the truth. We need the operation. Now, that's in the world of Hollywood. That's not only in the world in Hollywood. That's in the Pentecostal church. We're not jealousing against those things. And the pastor was weak enough to let him get by with it. If you cried against the thing, the whole church in one big united army, that would have ceased a long time ago. But all we've got it now, there's no difference. They just do anything they want to. Liberation of women. They wear these little old dirty-looking brother clothes and go out on the street. And let me say something right here, my lady. I hope you all love me. And I'm not here to criticize you. I'm only here to know that yonder at the day of judgment, I'll have to answer when I know these things and don't want Then if I do warn you, then the blood's off of my hand. Did you know Jesus Christ said, Whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart? Does anybody know that? And if you dress yourself sexy-like, no matter how modest you think it is, and go out on the street and some old sinner looks at you to lust at you, at the judgment bar, you'll be guilty of committing adultery with that man when he answers for it. 
Why is it it was you was the one who done it? You presented yourself that way, so you are the guilty one. And you, no matter how virgin and pure you've lived, you'll be guilty before God of committing adultery with a sinner. Just the same as you went through the act. Jesus said so. That's not sheer milk, brother. That's the truth. It's Bible. But it's what God's word says. It cuts and sharper than a two-edged sword. I don't know whether your pastor appreciates that or not, but I'm telling you, my sister, at the judgment bar, I have to answer for it, and if I don't say these things, I don't care how many people say the liberation of women, that's a doctrine of the devil, and it's not in this Bible. Right. right. You see what happened back in Rome? You see what happened in Greece? You see what happened back in the old Roman Calvary long ago to the Christian church when it got to acting like the world? You know history, or your pastor should teach it to you, and you see at every age that happens to that crop, and you see exactly where it is that man, the Pentecostal church, so it's time to draw a line and make a verse and then preach the truth. you got examples the same at your house if they have examples. So let's draw a line, straighten ourselves up, and walk like men and women ought to. And present ourselves. Now the man, the person is dressed, he's got a, 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 a sacred, uh, not a person like a woman's body. We realize that. Now, it's the women. And the women is marvelous. I've been called a woman hater. Anybody said that, is, that there, there's something wrong. I am not. But I, I love them and I want them to be God's daughters and to act like God's daughters. Just the same as man. We must do that. So we see those things as an example. And while you committee is here, while your convention is going on, brother, what happened to you? You're reading the same Bible. You know the Bible teaches those things. So let's get down to business with it. Let's either be for God or be against God. When did God answer the most? When we acted like Christians or now? Why, well, John Wesley's move and raise up and condemn this Pentecostal generation back in the old hole in his time. Now, you know that story. John Wesley was more respectable in his teaching and in the old fashioned church long ago than we Pentecostal have ever been. That's true. Look what they did. They did things that we know nothing about. But God honored them and blessed them because they walked up right before God. That's right, and we know that to be an example. Now, but when he come down and made fellowship with Ahab, then he got in trouble. Now, Ahab, when you take the world that's trying to find fellowship with you, just remember there's a rabbit in the wood pile somewhere. When you take that little cigarette-smoking boy that wants to take you out at night time, young lady, you Pentecostal girl, that little drinker and his hair comb down, sticking up to hold his mouth open, let me tell you something now. There's something in the making. And he says, I am marrying you, dear. If, uh, and now I'll join your church. He's going to lie to you. If he loves you and loves the Lord, he'll do it then. He don't have to take you. Right. And you man, you young boy, to some of these little painted up Jezebels, the same way. You shouldn't do that. Same on the pastors that fail to say that in this church. We are all out, separated, different people, sanctified to the Lord in the Yes, sir, we know the landmarks. They wrote right down here a plain view of it. But we're just talking about this, coming to all this, that, and all this, that. We just fell up all right with it. Sure, the Bible said the devil would be doing that in the last days. And that's exactly what he's doing. Now, then he made him a great dinner. And in Bible, now he had some motive of doing that. He said, because he knew he was a great, powerful man. And he said, now, let's join our ranks together. And let's just all come uh, in one great big rank, and then we'll go up to Rima Gilead. And then when we go up there, we'll defeat the enemy because this certain, certain ground belongs to us. Anyhow, Rima Gilead belongs to us. And it's actually our possession. So you help us go up and get what our possession is. Be greedy. And there's words of Hassan has made his mistake. Then being a spiritual man, though, he said, Yes, I'll go with you, but first let's consult the law. That is a good thing. 
Any and everything. And then he said, all right, we'll just do that. Now, I've got a seminary down here. I've got some of the best prophets here. Oh, they're educated to the moment. They're the smartest man there is in the country. Because I've seen to it. I've taken care of them. I support the seminary. And I've got some of the best, so I'll call for the elect to come. So he went and got all the fine scholars and brought them up there, and they all got together, 400 of them. And he said, shall we? I can see the king. And everybody's just going out there. Whatever the king says, whatever the bishop says, they all do, you know. The general overseer, you know. What he says, they all do. He turned in his coat, you know, and said, our gentlemen, shall I go up there? Ramus Gilead, or shall I forbear? One said, you know who that is, don't you? You know where our meal comes from. We'll be excommunicated. We won't have this, and we won't have nothing to back us up. Mm-hmm. Now, you better watch. What do you say about it, Pastor? Well, I'll tell you. I think he's better. Yes, I think so, too. What about the superintendent? What does he say? Oh, he passes the word right along. We all better say good about the king. Oh, my. We better say, oh, this is the greatest denomination there is, and none like it. Nothing to do it but this. We're the only ones that have to say so. But they all come out with one of the cards and oh, the Lord has got up. He's with you. They have said, you see? <clears throat> sure, we're going up. But you know, there was something about a spiritual man when it's no matter how many says yes, if it's contrary to the word, that man don't believe it. Right. The officer said, well, how many got out there? He said, 400. And they're all seminary students. They're great men. And it was one of cards. They're giving us the right. Oh, we just got the win. And he said, but, 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 but haven't you got one more? Well, what do you need one more for? Here's 400, the best. What would one more make any difference? If you got 400 saying yes, well, I'll well, ask for one more said, but, you know, haven't you just got one more? <laughs> he said, yes, I got a little holy roller down here. <laughs> but he, uh, well, the holy roller is an outcast, you know, he said. He said, I got one down here, but I hate him. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sure. Got to. He stepped on his corns all the time. He kind of left, left him around a little bit. He said, I'll tell you before he comes, I hate him. He said, because he's always saying evil against me. Sure, what else could he do? The Lord said evil against him. So how can I hold my peace about Christian women chaining up? How do I hold my peace of the weakness of the Christian church when the Lord's against us? Sure it is. The Lord's against us. I don't care what the pastor says, the word says so. Let's say on the word. Hey, Harvard was giving one consent. But it was all right to go ahead and do it. Yeah, that's all right. I didn't get hurt. No, don't believe him. He's, he's weak minded. But Pastor had the truth. That's what we want is the truth. Where is the word hurt circumciser who cuts off? We want the truth. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Amen. Oh, sure. Oh, he said, they look who they got. They got that group of holy roller out there now. Listen to him now. But I want you to notice, before he got there, they sent a committee to me and said, now look, all the theological seminary boys are up there, and there's everyone told the king it was all right for him to go do what he wants to do. Now, Michael, don't you say anything contrary to what they say. Now, you want to unite together now. You want to say the same thing he said. If it would have been according to the word, it would have been right. But it was contrary to the word. That's right. Like a minister here not long ago was saying he was going evangelist, going to a church to hold a, a meeting. And I hope you don't take this for a joke because it's no place for joke. It was absolutely told to me for the truth. And it was supposed to be in a non-denominational church. And the deacon board met him down at a certain place on the train he got on and said, are you the evangelist? He said, I am. He was reading his Bible. 
writing down some notes as he studied and prayed. He said, now, we were sent as a committee from the church to tell you now a few things about our church. He said, all right, I'd like to hear them. Before we get there, I know more how to approach the church and the people. He said, I want to be a blessing to you while I'm there. He said, all right, that's what we want you to be. Now, we just say to you, Evangelist, that don't say anything about horse racing. They're because the pastor owns a race horse. And he said, and he bets on the races all the time. And we would not have you to hurt our pastor's feelings at all. And said, so now, usually, Francis has run five fireballs. And said, we had better stop, and that is you. So, uh, don't say nothing. Usually, they're always kicking about these little Bunko games in the church. So, now, the Women's Aid Society always had a Bunko game every Wednesday night after prayer meeting in the basement. So be sure don't say nothing about that. And he went on with a whole list of things that he could not do, could not talk about. The evangelist said, then what will I talk about? And he said, you might speak about the Jews because you only have one of them in the church. <laughs> now, there is such evangelism as that today in Pentecost. They're afraid to speak the truth. Right. I don't care if it hurts the pastor who hurts. It's God's eternal word. And we're responsible for it. A preaching of it. We must tell the truth. I don't care how bad it hurts. But you know, they spoke to the wrong man when they spoke to Michael like that. Oh, he wasn't one of these compromises with his wing set to see if he get a good offering or not. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. He was a man of God. Well, I could imagine the scripture doesn't say so. But it may be that perhaps they said, now, if you'll say the same thing with these prophets say from the seminary, you know what? They might give you a degree from that prophet. <laughs> you know, they might absolutely, after a while, after you learn to speak a little better grammar, you know what? They might actually make you one of them if you'll say the same thing they say. Oh, yeah, they'll do that yet today, too. They really will. But what did this little holy roller say? He said, I'll only say what my God puts in my mouth to say. Amen. Amen. That is the kind of a man to have. No wonder the Holy Ghost down in Jehoshaphat's heart said, yet there's one more. He'll tell you the truth. He'll tell you the truth. Just one more, but he'll really be honest with you. So then, little Micah comes over as this praying and seeing a vision, and Jehoshaphat said, for all these 400 preachers around him, the doctor, Ph.D., and all the rest of them, you know, around there, and the general superintendent, and the, the bishop, and the, all of them, you know, all around us, all great fellowship, eating lamb steaks and so forth, having a wonderful time. And they were all dressed just right, their collars turned around, and their long robes flowing, you know, with the Holy Father wrote on them, and everything like that, you know, all dressed up. But you know, that just didn't please the man of God down in his heart. He thought there was something different from that. I do too. I really do. But the reminder of Saul trying to put his ecclesiastical death on David, it just didn't work on the man of God. That was all. Just don't fit him out. Just take this thing off here. I've never proved it. Now, that's what we need to do. Take off some of our ecclesiastical deaths and put on the righteousness of Jesus Christ. God is speaking great big words for the whole congregation. Don't know what we're talking about anyhow. That's right. Just plain old fast last preaching is what'll save them. It's the truth. No matter how flat footed it is, it's just the word anyhow. They understand it that way. We're not rich and up to date and all these great big things. We're old fashioned. But we should be. Now, we don't have to learn how to use great uh, grammar and do all these great words and things. Just speak it plain. Right. Then, that takes a place for a time. The next thing we find out, that these great classical standing out, and let me speak this just a minute. Did you know where Christ comes from? Christ is of the devil. 
Now that thus saith the Lord of the Bible. Flesh and pomp came from the devil. In the very beginning, when Cain and Abel come up to worship, Cain come before the Lord and flesh. Abel came in righteousness by revelation. Now look, when Cain came, he brought the fruits of the field, everything that grows, the flowers and everything, and decorated his altar, and he worshiped God. A true picture of the carnal church member today and the carnal minded pastor who wants the churches to call and the rest of them in the city and, and their seats all crushed and million dollar pipe organs. God don't care that for that. Like, don't have a thing. You fill all those perfect places like that and send your people until they're just about poor poppers and everything else with all your stuff to put in the church and thousands of heathens dying on the mission field without knowing Christ one time. Why is it a disgrace to Christianity? Yes. Or if you only could see me one time, you know what I was speaking of. Building a million dollar church. And two thirds of the world never heard of Jesus Christ. What a pity. Now, watch him. Then it was class, and Cain came, undaunted with Satan, and made a great big classical thing. But now, Abel, when he came, he never came in class, but he came in revelation. The Bible said in Hebrews 3 that Abel, by faith, offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. And the only way he did it was by faith, and faith in what? The Word of God, because that's the only thing he can have faith in. God had revealed to him that it was the blood, and Cain had a beautiful offering, yet not covered in blood. And Abel didn't have a beautiful offering, but it was covered in blood. And it was according to the Word. And God recognized it because it was his word. And today, God's not watching the great big church, how Billy's biggest builder, how well the, the choir can sing, or all this and the other, or what class of people, whether well-dressed or not well-dressed in your church. He is not looking for such things as that. No, not by a million miles, he's not. He's watching for someone to come the way of the blood. Revelation! And able by faith, he heard the word of God and took God at his word. And by faith in the word of God, God received him. That's the only way God will ever receive anybody that's not taking God at his word by revelation that God will keep his word. God said the Holy Ghost is good for this day, that settles it for me. If God put the power in the church to heal the sick and cast out devils and the prophets and so forth, set them in the church, and promised it that they would be to the end of the world, that satisfies it to me. That they had any heroes in a hammer chicken would do like a worm in a lemon, run here, squeeze out here, squeeze out there, it doesn't make a bit of difference. God said so, and that tells it. The holy God has faith in his word. Now, God told King, said, if you do well, see, but if you not, sin lies at the door. Sure, came with a type of the carnal believer today who goes down and thinks, I'll join the small biggest church there is in Chicago is so and so and Dr. So and so. I'll go join that over there. Then you go to read in the Bible and you find out that none of the things that Jesus said was going on in the church, these signs shall follow that believer. It doesn't follow. Jesus said they shall follow them that believe. Right. Now, they maybe will, perhaps they will, they will for a certain amount of time. He said, these signs shall follow them that believe, and it was promised to the end of the hell. Right. I want the page of scripture where he couldn't tuck it away from him. That he would contradict his own words. Do you know what a mess you get into? These signs shall follow them that was a mercy on the mail. A mark of true believers that he was in their midst of, he's just showing himself and manifesting himself by these signs. Amen. Now, to think a church being built on that, let the world creep in? Well, certainly it will rise the indignation of a real true servant of God. Sure, it's wrong. Let's get the thing out of there. Get away from this old lukewarm, halfway, 
say a little prayer in the morning, a little prayer at night, and go to bed, and get up the next morning. No wonder we're getting worried. No wonder the Lord speaks into the church. Because we don't say a prayer, there's no more agonizing. You're no more saying before God. There's no more digging out, cleaning up. We need an old-fashioned revival. We just pull ourselves. We're the assemblies. We're the Pentecostals. We're the oneness. We're the trinities. We're this, that, that. We don't have them to that other group. That's where the Holy Spirit leads you, right there. When you get that in your mind, brother, you just might as well go back to the altar because that's the place you belong. Right. Amen. That's how worldly it preaches. Let's forget about it. Let's put our affections on Christ and look to Christ and Him alone. Amen. And then have fellowship one with another while the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. If He comes to mark today, every one of us without a fall, who would He mark? If you think the next man's an error, remember the grace of God just as real to him as it is to you. But I hate to mark me today whether I was faultless or not. I don't trust in that. I trust in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ to take me through. I stand in his grace alone. Nothing in my arms I bring. I've done nothing. I've said nothing. That's worth nothing. As I bring that, the Lord, I just wholly depend on you. Just you and you alone. Sure, Lord, if I love you with a true heart, I'll certainly love you and walk and try my best not to do to hurt you. If I do do anything to you wrong, I'll repent for it as quick as I do it. I love my wife. If I do anything wrong to her, I'd repent immediately for it if I did it not knowingly. Or I'd repent and tell her I was sorry I'd done it. And sure, I would to my Lord. And I wouldn't do nothing to hurt the poor little thing for nothing in the world. And neither would I do to hurt God a million times more than my wife. If you love him, you respect him, and you'll walk right. There. Notice. But what we got off is on our theology. Oh, my. You know, Dr. So and so, he's such a classic man. Oh, do you know he's speaking two or three different languages? <laughs> He does all this, that, that. You know what? He passed the great so-and-so church one time. <laughs> Ain't that something? Oh, you ought to hear how he says, Ah, oh, man, it's the most beautiful. I read a piece of paper today about that man where it said that a certain bishop of a certain church prayed the prettiest prayer to a certain denomination that was ever prayed. <laughs> That's what he prayed to the denomination, <laughs> not the Christ. <laughs> That's right. Talk about a half a page of paper, right? His prayer out. He prayed it to the denomination, a pretty prayer. Oh, and that's coming into Pentecost, too. Oh, yes, we're getting a place so pretty. Do things so pretty and look so pretty. Here, we're getting just like the rest of them. Time to shake yourself. Come on with it. Right. What about the blood? Don't be like Cain's offering. Keep the blood over you. I don't care how ugly and raw and broken language and everything else it is. Keep the blood. That's what we need. Keep under the blood. We notice this classical. Yes, God gave him a chance. He said, now, if you'll do well, it'll be all right. You'll be accepted. But if you don't do well, then sin lies at the door. Now, you've seen that I have accepted this, this plan here, and I have not accepted yours. But now, if you'll do well, you'll come over and fellowship here. Right. These signs shall follow them that believe. And if you see, I have accepted that doctrine, my Bible. I have kept my word. I have confirmed it amongst the people. Now, if you'll do well, come on over with them. Let's have fellowship one with another. So what the king do, just exactly like they do today. He sought out a way to put him out of order. <laughs> That's right. Brother, someday, don't you worry. If you're a real true Christian, your high will be for sale. That's, don't you worry about that. And right now, you're hated among all people for his name's sake. Despised and rejected. And he said, now, if you'll do well, but he didn't do well. But he slew his brother. Always classic. But no matter how classical all these preachers and before these two kings, yet Michael said, I saw right in a vision. God sitting upon his throne and the host of heaven standing at his right and left hand. And they said, who can we get to go down and deceive Ahab to get him out there to fulfill the word of God? If you want to see vision, if you want to be right, stay in the word. God works right in the word. That's the plan. See? Now, Micah, look, here's a secret. Micah was staying right with what the prophet said. A prophet, Elijah, 
because Ahab had done the evil, he said the dogs will lick your blood. And how is all your death and righteous neighbor? And how that the word of God through that prophet, which was God's word, come to the prophet, and they stayed right with that. And Micah couldn't go right or left from it because it was already confirmed the word of God. Right. Right. God's word was with the prophets in them days. He had the law, but he had his word with the prophets. And Micah, being a prophet, a true prophet, now look, let me show you something. Oh, I did. Look at here. This is fresh. There were 400 seminary students who claimed to know the word and wasn't respecting it. They tried to bypass it because of pop. They tried to bypass it because it was the king to pat somebody on the back. But this little holy roller, as I called him a while ago, he didn't care how much pat on the back went on. He stayed with God's word. Amen. Amen. And he couldn't prophesy nothing or preach unto what the word said. Amen. 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 There it is. There it is, brother. Try to back that word up every time. Amen. He didn't care what the seminary thought. He didn't care what any of the rest of them was. He knew the word of God pronounced a curse on Ahab and nothing else could take the place of it. So therefore, being with the word and lined up with the word, the Holy Ghost lined up with him. For he lined with the Holy Ghost and salvation. Amen. Welcome. Feel uh, real good, real religious. Get with the word. Stay with the word. And if ever a true vision comes, it'll come by the word. Amen. Amen. Never thought of that before. That's a new one. Thanks a lot. Stay with the word, brother. Elijah, uh, Micah was with the word because the word had pronounced cursings on that thing. And how can Micah say anything else but stay with the word? So by staying with the word, God showed him a continuation of the word. Hallelujah. There you are. I hope you think that you like it does me. There it is. God will show the continuation of the word. But sure, go on if you want to. So I go do what the preacher said you do. But I saw Israel scattered like sheep that had no shepherd. So I saw God in heaven. I saw the throne and the host of heaven standing at right and left hand. But who can we get to go down and see they have? Who can we get to bring him out here to fulfill Elijah's prophecy? See, Michael was right on that word. <laughs> that word had to be fulfilled. And a lion spirit come up, come out of hell. Come up there and say, oh, I can do something for you. But you know what? I can get that sin there easy because they don't have no very much spare me. It's just no agonizing. There's nothing around there, no blood, so I can just walk in when I want to. <laughs> I ain't take possession of that thing. You got a whole denomination. <laughs> I ain't get the whole thing. They don't even believe in the blood. So I, I can take the whole thing. God said, that's right. You can't do that. <laughs> but I'll go down there and get in them fellows and cause them to prophesy a lie, all them preachers. So every one of them, all the great theology, I'll just blind their eyes from the word. At the end, I'll have to keep that word so they can't see it. You know, God does that a lot of times. So they got eyes and can't see, ears and can't hear. Is that right? That's right. Sure. So I blind their eyes and they can't see it. So I just go down and call them to be inspired. And they'll prophesy a lie. Then you'll get him up there. And so one of these preachers old did his, did his um, great prestige become so, uh, um, what would I say? It become so degraded before the people that he walked up and smacked him in the face. He said, which away went the Spirit of God out of me? Now, he said he had the Spirit of God. But it was a lying spirit because it was contrary to the Word. Right. Now, people say it's signs and wonders that follow. It's a lying spirit. It's contrary right. to the Word. Right. If the Bible says people tell you the Holy Ghost ain't in this day, it seems it was the other days, it's a lying spirit. It's in false prophets. They're telling you a lie. If the Spirit gets this as all liberation women and do all these other things and go out back to the world, it's a lying spirit. It's not lined up with the Word. Stay in the Word. Right. Stay right there. Now, and you know what the story came out. What was it? Years had passed. 
But the time had come for that word to be fulfilled. When the season rolls around, don't you worry, the crop will be there. It's right. And brethren, if there ever was a time, for the next few minutes now, I want to talk to you to your heart. If there ever was a time that the time has come for the word to be fulfilled, it's now. This is the day. Seeds have been planted. It's time to take the hoe and get out here and go to cut out some of these weeds and things we got grown up. Saw bars and stink weeds and everything else that's grown up amongst their people. Doubters, disbelievers, lukewarm, everything else. It's time for us to get the hoe and chop it out. There's nothing any better than a two-edged sword of God to cut it with. The time had come in the Andalusian world for God to share his word made true to the Andalusian people. And he respected Noah. The time had come in Babylon, where it was the last God to scorn. They made fun of, of the Hebrew children. They laughed at him, told him his own fogies and everything. They ought to be modern. But they they put. God respect that same put. And they had laughed at him, thrown him in jail, done everything to him. But finally, the time come for God to speak. And he showed his power. He was able to deliver him from the fiery furnace. He showed his power when the time comes, when Daniel was thrown into the lion's den. The time had come for God to move out and to speak. And he closed the mouth of the lion, the son of an angel, into the den with Daniel. Jesus, just before Calvary, the time had come when the proclamation must be signed. There come a time where Adam's race was at the end of the road. Something had to be done. It was at that time that Zachariah, standing in the temple, saw an angel of God who warned him and told him what was going to happen. The time was at hand. And he was shouting the angel's word and was sick and dumb. The time come when Mary was coming to the well that day with a pot of water on her head. The time had come for the visitation of the Savior. And she, and a virgin, was conceived and bare a son. The time was there regardless of what the world didn't even believe it was all out of line with their teaching. But the time come. And when the time is coming, it's going to happen. Amen. 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 The angel Gabriel met the virgin and told her she'd be overshadowed by the Holy Ghost and would bring forth a son and he'd be the son of God. Never had happened in all the world but the time had come. Whenever Jewish woman had waited and watched for the time for this, hoping it would be her, but the time come when God made his choice. God makes the choice. The time comes when John the Baptist was born as a forerunner to fulfill the word of God. Because he was the voice of one crying in the wilderness in Isaiah 40, that there be one several hundred years before he comes. The time comes for John to be born. And when the time comes, John arrives on the scene. Amen. The time to come after Jesus' death, after Calvary, the time come there that he must die for the sins of the world. And he died just according to the scripture because everybody believed that lined up with the word and the time comes. Yes. That it must be fulfilled. And he died between two malefactors. They went by breaking their legs with hammers. And the woman raised back the mall to break his legs. But the time comes when the Bible must be fulfilled. When it said there won't be a bone broken in his body. And he held his feet. What was it? The angel of God stayed his hand. The time had come for the scripture to be fulfilled. They put him in the grave. They put a seal on the grave. They gasped a bunch of soldiers, a century, a hundred men, armed around there to be sure that nothing would take place for three days. He laid there through Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. But on Sunday morning, the first Easter, no matter how many armies was there, how well they were garrisoned, the time had come for the word of God to be fulfilled. Uh, I'll 
what? That was my holy one to see corruption. Neither will I leave this poor in hell. The time it comes. I don't care what takes place. It's going to happen anyhow. The time it comes. When an angel comes from heaven and a man fell like dead men in the grave, open and Christ walked out victorious Amen. over death, hell, and the grave. The time it comes. Amen. After that, he commissioned his disciples to go to all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He said, before you go, I don't care how well educated you are. I don't care how much you walk with me. Before you can be a witness to me, you've got to wait down here until you're in due with power from on high. What was it? He was lying with the word. Joel said, in the last days it will come to pass, I'll pour out my spirit upon all this. Your sons and daughters to prophesy. Jesus before death said, This gospel is be preached to all the ends of the world for a witness unto me. And let's begin in Jerusalem. Luke 24, 49. Notice. Then they went up in the room. One of them said, Well, how long we have to wait here? Oh, it's all people are going out. I can hear him say, He never said, How long to wait? He said, Wait until. You're in due with power. How long will we wait? That isn't the question. That isn't the commission. Is wait until you're in due. Right. How long should I pray? How many more days should I wait? To the revival break now. Brother, wait until God pours out his power. Right. Not until we elect a new bishop. Not until we put a new pastor. But wait until the Holy Ghost comes from heaven. I can rest the mighty wind. Not wait till we choose who's going to be the bishop of this group. Not wait and see who's going to be the overseer of this group. But wait until you have organized yourself. No, sir. Not wait until you set up a district president. No, sir. Not wait until you have enough finance to build a new church. No, sir. But wait until you're in due with power from on high. Amen. And then when that complete Pentecostal number was fulfilled 50 days, the time had come. Hallelujah. The time had come for Joel's prophecy to be fulfilled. The time had come for Jesus to pour out his spirit. The time had come for the full. Oh, Pastor, that what's good. Oh, it's stammering the other tongues while I speak to this people, and this is the refreshing. Amen. This is the rest that shall come from the presence of the Lord. No matter that never spoke since Babylon, but it was time to come for God to unite the nations together and band together, one heart, one accord, whether what language or whatever it was, he spoke and ever died of the heavens. One group of people, all Galileans, the time had come. Amen. Brother, the time has come. We're in the last days. We're in the atomic age. The time has come that they got a weapon that can shake this world from its orbit and five minutes time into the sun and cause a total annihilation. They could have done that before, but the time has come. Amen. The time has come where there's a falling away. The Bible said, except there come a falling away, the man of sin will reveal himself. The Pentecostal church is living in the falling away time. The time has come. The time has come for the signs to follow the believers. We're at the end time. We're in the latter rain. We're at the time where man will be heavy, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Truth speakers, false accusers, incontinent, and despise those that are good. Right. Heady, high-minded. The time has come when they're teaching doctrines of devils, perverting the Bible teaching into theories and theologies to draw groups of people away from Ashram. The time has come that God will gather his church together soon under one great big banner of the Lord Jesus Christ and pour out. His power is among them, and great signs and wonders will take place. The time is come. The time is come for the Pentecostal church to make a stand. 
What time has come to circumcise the church and call off this foolishness? What time has come to go back to the old landmark? The time has come for the outpouring. The time has come for the gathering of the people. The time has come for Jesus to come. The time will be here soon to get out to the world. Brother, be careful. Let your challenge to sit on someone else's head. The time has come. We're at the end time. If we ever go to do anything, brethren, we're going to do it now. The time is at hand. The time has come when God takes every every denomination under the sun. I was reading an article where a great theologian in the Baptist church come to one of the meetings. When he seen the work of the Holy Ghost, he was in the voice of healing. Therefore, they were reprinted again. Well, then he said, a Baptist cried meets a Pentecostal prophet. And he threw away all of his literature. He threw away all of his theology. Got there and said, God, if you can do that for that man, do it for me. And he's just locked with glory and he's taken three different languages and went to the platform praying for the sick and God working fine. Amen. Amen. The time is come. That's a Jew. The time is come for the prospectors to go to Dugan. The Jews are coming out of every denomination in Paris, step and give and gifts and set out in order. Hallelujah. The time is here. The time is here right now. The baptism of the Holy Ghost moves to the city again. It's time for sinners to reflect. It's time for backsliders to get right with God. It's time for cleaning up in the church. It's time for signs of God's children. Everybody waiting on the sign. The signs of Mark 16 has been fulfilled. So it is. David waited for a sign. He heard, he waited. He waited to start. Then at once he heard the mulberry bushes rattling. He knew God was going before him. Brother, the time has come when the Pentecostal mulberry bushes are being struck again by the outpouring of the Holy Ghost, by the time of the Pentecost, that question might win the temple seven. The time has come. The time has come. The time. Separate 
yourself be aligned with the Word. God is with us. God is showing his hand in mercy. Friends, I think what we need to do is a solemn old fashioned breaking down before God and saying, God, I repent for all my evil, and now forgive me and help me to be a real Christian. Let us not with not with no other way but a broken heart of our evil, while God is in our midst, maybe for the last time for a long time. If he is in our midst now to give us this time of repentance, let us repent with all of our hearts and give God glory and take a new hope today and serve him and come out. You women, clean yourselves up. You men, be Christians. You preachers, go to your pulpit preaching. God is with us. If there ever was a time when I was in Sweden or Finland, they were pulling hires and scratching the ground to get the seed in. If they didn't do it, soon the snow would come, they'd starve the next year. Brothers, sisters, the seed's being sold on that ground by the Holy Spirit. Let's let it take hold now and grow. Jesus of Nazareth. Oh. Oh. Lord, 
a witness and a name that you're in our midst, and knowing that we're to stand in your presence someday to give an account for our words, even to our thoughts. And we pray, Father, that you'll wash us and cleanse us from all sin, and to make us pure-hearted and clean-minded, and with one motive, to see souls born to the Lord Jesus Christ. Make us missionary-minded. Oh, God, may we go into the street. Oh, where is the boss in the street? No more speaking. No more nothing. And the world has become one stinking place, Lord. Oh, because that we have let down. Forgive us, Lord. May we cry out the prophets of old. Oh, help us, dear God. We pray that you'll receive our repentance and wash us and cleanse us and give us the gift of the Spirit and move in us, O oh Lord, afresh this day and from this day henceforth. I present this prayer to thee for the people and for myself in Jesus Christ's name. What has happened? What is this? Ask yourself that question. It's the same Holy Spirit who knows the secret of every heart. Let's shake hands with one another and say, if I have harmed you or done anything, God forgive me. This is to you, to, from me to you. If I have done aught against anyone, God forgive me. If I've let out or compromised, God forgive me. I want to be the servant of the law. I want to love everybody. And above all, I want to love the Lord so that I can stand up and between the living and dead to minister for him. I love him. I'm expecting something great to happen now since this marvelous visitation. I believe it with all my heart. I will praise him, praise the Lamb for sinners slain, give him glory all ye people, for his blood can wash away his sins. Oh, my. I will praise him. I will praise him. Praise the Lamb for sinners. Give him glory on the earth.